I'm going to be basing my conversation a little bit around nature-based solutions. This was going to be mostly a more generic introduction to the topic for people who are not fully into it at the moment. The key question is, why do we have to be talking about nature-based solutions and why now? So one of the important aspects to remember and to notice is that we're moving strongly from this tree-hugging approach to nature and thinking more about how nature plays different roles as infrastructure. So we hear the green infrastructure, we hear about natural capital, natural assets, ecosystem services, national natural wealth. We hear about nature's contributions to people. So all of this different terminology is basically helping us to extend our understanding of what nature is beyond the traditional understanding of nature as timber or wood or, or fish, as they tend to be reflected in national accounts. And also because, very importantly, many aspects of nature are at the forefront of climate change. So this provides an opportunity to link up agendas as much as possible and understand what are the synergies. But when we do these, we also have to be very clear that nature is not a uniform term. We have many different components and because of that, we're going to have many potentials for synergies uh, throughout, but there will be many trade-offs as well. There will be potentials and links for wealth creation and for poverty alleviation, but at the same time, we know very clearly from many years of experience that approaches pro-nature could also be bad for poverty if the intrinsic and existing governance systems are against poor and vulnerable people. So we just need to be very careful with these approaches and how do we take this forward. In Africa especially, we know that there's huge richness of different elements of nature. We have, that just from the most recent IPPS report, um, we know that uh, over 62%, in some places even more, of people in rural areas depend on nature. Uh, much of these dependencies actually carry on on uh, cities as well because of the connections. It's a huge population, 1.25 billion people, that is expected to double by 2050. So the, the pressures that we see now are going to be spread even much bigger than that. And um, climate change is bringing in these massive vulnerabilities that will be especially felt directly into water, soil, species compositions, sectors that are already under massive stress. We've seen this a year before, and this is a really interesting one, I think. It was said before, there's a lot of emphasis on mitigation and um, our need to look into how do we reduce this pressure of emissions into the atmosphere, but also increasingly we need to keep making a, a focus on adaptation. Nature-based solutions is um, proposed as one of the elements that could play an important role for mitigation. And it's not a huge role. So it is important, but not huge. So that's the other thing to remember. So places like Africa, the mitigation agenda will be important, but will be small. Most of the effort is going to be on understanding how nature can help us um, on adaptation and in building resilience. Importantly, also to remember that these solutions are not new. So we've been talking about them for a long time. And the term nature-based solutions is just another term. We're very good at recycling terms and putting new names, but it's things that we've been doing for a long time. Forests are really important, are one of the most effective and efficient and cost-effective as well method to reduce and to adapt to climate change. And within forests, we have many different elements of nature that can be brought into the roles as well. So it's not just a conservationist agenda, and that's another of the important elements to take into account. We also talk about agriculture, grasslands, uh, wetlands. There's um, a lot of uh, really useful information that tell us how these different parts of land uses can help us with the mitigation. But we don't have much, really, is information like this in terms of adaptation and resilience. So we were still lacking those indicators to be able to make this offer in a more clear way. And um, we need to have a lot more guidance on how do we operationalize these activities. And very importantly, how do we scale this up in big ways. So we're still struggling. Um, having worked for many years on the other side of the fence with the people who are actually implementing these activities and having moved to DFIT now, it's, it's really difficult. You can really see the, the divide between the funding and the allocation and the actual making the change on the ground 
So we need to have much better systems within DFID to make sure that we implement this. An important question for us is why should DFID care? So there's always this nature, it always goes at the bottom of the agenda, especially when shock, short term shocks take place. The nature, once again, it falls back. And with it also, when I talk about nature and this in the context of climate change as well. However, we know already that we need to be careful that short-term shocks don't detract us too much from our long-term objectives. We already have in Africa, there's all the many resources, all the high dependencies and the potentials for household incomes and industries. However, we know that there's all of the governance systems are very uh, lacking the, the, the rights, the access, which means that there's very low capitalization, very low levels of investment and already high exposure to degradation climate change. We don't know yet we know that the impacts are going to be severe, big, and recurrent, but we still don't know what are our what, what are going to be the tipping points and when we reach irreversible damage. So we, we're working in this situation where we need to act now and, and we have some information. We may not have the best information, but there's a sense that we need to act. However, we keep going to ministries of finance and they say, well, our situation does not allow for this. We have all of this public debt. We, we have all of these limitations that stopped us from um, investing in this initiative. However, we see also a growing, this, all this political momentum. Now again, nature is back on the table. And there are big interests and commitments. And, and COP26, this is a, a new one, to really, where nature is, is back onto how do we use nature to fight climate change, but then how do we make sure that it's not just about mitigation, it's not just going to be hijacked by the usual suspects as well, to use the same name before. How do we operationalize this nature ica portfolio within DFIT, so that the different linkages in there link to the implementation and the delivery of ODA uh, funding. So that's really important. And when we're making the value for money arguments in our programming, we, we need to be able to have easy access information where we can build suitable cases where that would allow us for flexibility and adaptation, but also will give us figures that will compete with other uh, value for money arguments that will be the ones that get revised in QAU or the Treasury Office. So we, we need better information in this. I was just going to present this case that we did an economic valuation in Bhutan. This was before DFIT and when I was still at IIED, when we were trying to use different um, tools, economic, social and biophysical elements to help the government understand how they see the contributions of nature beyond just timber, but also how do they bring in nature as a key element for prosperity, really, which is what resonates mostly with um, the different departments. So we went through a whole process of trying to get people to understand the different components of value um, and the, the roles that nature plays within this value. And this is kind of going like um, ecosystem services 101 back at uni to see uh, this ecosystem. Sorry, I use as just a tree, but it could easily be a grass um, grasslands, a sea grasses or wetland or um, any other ecosystem. Um, how the interactions of this biophysical infrastructure with people, with technology and with access rules are the ones that determine value who benefits, who loses, um, and how can we do this in a, a sustainable way. In the case of Bhutan, we asked people, that was the first thing that we asked, what kind of values are we talking about here for your country, for your current situation, for the future? To whom? Who, who benefits from these services, from nature? What data do we have? How can we model this? How can we use this information? And we did a lot of capacity building throughout this analysis. So it was always this um, engagement with the government, with the mid-level government technical capacities, with the communities to try to understand how they see nature as part of the activities. And then how do you bring these um, perceptions higher and higher up until you come back to the uh, Ministry of Finance to uh, present your results. What we wanted to present in here, it was a bit of a different 
proposal to what was initially asked for us. Initially, the government of Bhutan, the department, they just wanted to understand how much money, basically, they were going to be able to get from selling carbon in international markets. And what we tried to do and what we did at the end was to really help them to understand that actually these different elements of nature was playing such important key roles in values for their country and that benefits like carbon or international biodiversity conservation were important for global communities. But the most important thing that they had to understand and that they got to understand through all of this was the many benefits um, direct benefit to infrastructure and in, to use the different terminology, the prosperity linked benefits that the economy was getting if they were to invest in this uh, nature base. The other thing that was really important and we wanted to, to focus on this was to help understand that the, the investments didn't have to be massive investments to be able to get returns, important returns. So these cost benefit uh, ratios were were very little, very manageable, and that people had to be moving away from seeing investing in nature as a, as a corporate social responsibility, which is not. And we need to really move into understanding that these are operational investments and cost, and that will help with the way that governments and the private sector as well uh, see nature in their proposals. So in this case, we, we were trying to uh, suggest a potential uh, financing, an internal financing and fundraising strategy, which got approved by the constitution as well. So they are working on implementing this. Just to remind people that when we talk about any of the elements of nature or climate change, we need to really be able to present arguments and fine tune them into ways that matter to the different groups. So communication, expertise and tools are really important, especially when we talk about very complicated arguments like biophysical uh, or risk or vulnerability. And they need to be just targeted very, very carefully to the different groups that we want to influence. Mm -hmm.